Awesome. Yes, it's great to be with you. It's always great to be back here. You can hear I have a different accent from the deep south, <laughs> meaning South Africa. So for any of you from outside America, I know how to play cricket. And I know it's the Cricket World Cup right now, and I know South Africa is going to win. We just thrashed Sri Lanka. We just thrashed Australia. India and Pakistan have no chance. Anyway, that's war talk. <laughs> yeah, so that's my background. Came to seminary, was 13 years in Central Asia, and have now been teaching for 11 years. So really uh, blessed by the Lord, but always excited to come talk to you guys. What an amazing opportunity you have on this campus and how God has brought the world to this campus. So uh, it always amazes me what God is doing there, and I'm so excited to be with you today. So we're specifically going to talk about how to understand a different worldview. And to start off, I want you to think of just by yourself, not out loud, but read these questions. And which of these would you agree with, that you're okay with these questions? All right, so as you're looking and thinking about whether you agree with that or not, your worldview is playing a very strong part of your decision, right? What's the basis for your decision? Have you thought about that? Should women drive cars? Uh, that sounds like a joke, right? <laughs> Do you know that they've only just started allowing women to drive cars in Saudi Arabia. Only just. They've not been allowed to drive car until now. Is a woman's primary role the home? A homemaker. In Islam, for example, you have to pray on Fridays today, right now at noon, you're supposed to go and pray at the mosque. If a man goes to pray at the mosque, it counts plus 25 points. He gets 25 bonus points for praying at the mosque, in, uh, uh, working his way to heaven. If a woman goes to pray at the mosque, it only counts one. But if she prays at home, it counts plus 25. Because the position is that a woman's role is to be in the home. She's a homemaker. So if you pray in the place God has designated for you, you get bonus points. But if you pray outside the place God has dedicated for you, you know bonus points. Worldview plays very strongly in how you answer and consider these questions. This is just women, I know. That's, this is because it's a big deal, right? And the women's rights and what women can and can't do. But we are very much affected by the worldview as to how we answer these questions. And this is just one example I could ask you lots of other examples about how we greet each other. And can you, do, can you do physical contact when you greet someone? Is it okay in your worldview that we shake hands? Can we hug when we greet? Where I come from in South Africa, we kiss when we greet. Is that okay? <laughs> what's, what's the basis of your decision? Why? Right. In South Africa, if you get a soda, when I grew up, and even now a lot of people, when you get a soda, I drink a soda. If you're thirsty, I give you, and you have a sip, and then I have a sip, and we, we share the bottle. Yeah, in America, oh, don't do that. If you do that, then you've obviously been a missionary for some time. Uh, we don't share. It's like, oh, uh, can I buy you one? Like, I'd rather buy you your own soda than let you have a sip of mine. Right? So there are all these things we do that our worldview plays so strongly into it. And so our challenge as those who know the Lord is twofold. Number one, the most important thing, what is a biblical worldview? I have my worldview, and the person I'm trying to share the gospel with has their worldview, and those are important, but way more important than those two. What's the biblical worldview? 
So that's why it's very impo important to be a student of the Bible. To read, because the Bible gives us God's worldview and helps us understand. And so that even if the culture says something, and it seems like, well, the culture thinks this is great, okay, fine, but what's God's worldview? So that's the one important thing. And then the other important thing is this person you're talking to, what's their worldview? What do they say? So if I'm born and raised in Texas and I say I'm going to watch football, what does that mean? It means a, a ball that you pick up and you actually don't use your feet. You, you pick it up and you throw it to each other, right? But if I'm speaking to anybody from Africa and I say I'm going to play football, what do they think? Soccer. Soccer. So it's not that they have to learn what I know. If I'm sharing the gospel, if I'm trying to reach them for Christ, I've got to make sure I'm communicating and they're hearing it in their worldview. So if I say I'm going to watch football to someone who's not from America, I'll say I'm going to watch American football. And then they get it. Ah, okay. Not real football. You're going to watch American football. <laughs> okay? All of these play into worldview. So let's set and d define what do we mean. So yeah, is, there are so many definitions in so many books. These are, this is more mine that I've taken from various uh, anthropologists about worldview. A person's beliefs and values that affect the way they see the, how the world works and how they fit into it. So it's your beliefs and your values that see how does the world work and how do I fit into that world. That's describing your worldview. So they visibly express through norms of behavior, through symbols, through rituals, those types of things are how you learn what a world person's worldview is. You can observe and then how they behave and you say, okay, now I see, now I'm learning about their worldview by the way that I see them behaving or what they do. Um, I'll give you an example. We, we're, re we're trying to reach Afghans and we've got this Afghan family in Fort Worth we've become friends with. And we invited them to Thanksgiving dinner. And we said, look, we're going to do all the food. It just come. And so they showed up and walked in with a full meal in their hands, an Afghan meal, to contribute to the Thanksgiving. We said, oh, but they could not. In an Afghan worldview, they value very highly hospitality. Hospitality is very, very high. They could not. Come to our house empty-handed. They could not. Now, for most of you, if I said, hey, I want you to come for Thanksgiving. Listen, we've got everything, man. We've got ham, turkeys, desserts, fixings. Just show up. Don't bring anything. If you bring stuff, it's going to be too much. Just show up. If I said that to you, would, would you bring food? No, you just show up. Not an Afghan. Even if you say that. They've got to bring food. They just have to bring food. So the, what, what does that express? So they show up with food and you're like, what's the matter with these people? Didn't they listen? Why are they bringing extra food? What are we going to do with this food? That could be my attitude. Or I could say, wait a bit. What does this express about their worldview, what they value, how they see the world and how they fit into the world? So they see Thanksgiving as a big celebration of a meal. The way they fit in is to bring food. And anywhere in their culture, you never say, out, if I say to you, ah, oh, yeah, come to my house, don't bring anything. I have to say that. Don't bring anything. But you know, if you're in that worldview, okay, it means bring something. Don't bring anything means bring something. In their worldview. But in our worldview, it means really don't bring anything. So all of this is important. It's the way you understand uh, uh, how they see the world and the assumptions that they make about the world. All right, so worldview, very, very significant. I'm going to go fairly quickly because I've got a few slides and I know we have to be done by a certain time, but I want you to be able to ask questions. If you have a question along the way, stop me.
And let's talk about it. And we'll try and leave some time for the end as well. I think that uh, uh, the assumptions of a worldview fit in three categories. A guy called Paul Hebert came up with these three categories. Really good. How to think of worldview. And I'm going to use where I served in Central Asia as examples. So first of all, one part of the assumptions in your worldview is cognitive. The way you think. Think of your head. The way you think about life. How life is ordered, the meaning attached to life. Okay? So, how do I think about things? So, take time. Where we lived in Central Asia, they thought about time in two ways. If we're doing business together, then we do it according to time. So, if I'm doing business with you and I say tomorrow, let's have a business meeting at 10 a.m., they'll show up at 10 a.m. And we have our business meeting. But they think a whole different way of time when it comes to hosting and guests. Time's irrelevant. And I always made that mistake. They would invite me for a meal. I'd, for dinner, I'd say, what, what time should we be there? They would always like, here he goes again. He's asking what time. It's like, uh, come around seven. What does that mean to me? from a Western point of view. Come around seven means come at seven. We'd show up at seven and they'd be, oh, they're here already? The food's not ready. They not The table's not ready. So they'll be polite, welcome us in, give us some tea, sit us down, but then disappear because they're busy preparing the meal, which we probably will eat at nine. Does that sound familiar to some of you from a different culture? And you don't ask, say, okay, so we'll, we'll start at 7, will we be done at 9? I mean, why are you asking about time? This is not, the whole evening is ours. We will spend the whole time together on this meal. There's no start and finish time. You come when you're ready, and we'll eat when we're ready, and we'll leave when we're ready. So you had to understand, that's how they think. There's a cognitive part about a worldview, how they think. And time is one example. We had to learn that. Uh, and we had to be ready to, if we invited guests and we said, come around seven, they might only come after eight. And they might not leave until after midnight. That was their cultural, the way they thought about time. All right? So you're going to meet people of different cultures here like that. And you've got to understand, they bring a way of thinking that's different. Just a different way of thinking into a relationship. It can get difficult and awkward. Uh, for example, if they ask to borrow money. So if they ask to borrow money, uh, ah, I just need $50, I'll pay you back. And you give them the $50. In your mind, from a Western point of view, American, this is a contract almost. It's a transaction. I've loaned you 50 and you said you're going to pay me back. Their worldview may not see it that way. I'll, you know, Maybe I'll pay it back. Maybe it will be in a year's time. Uh, but the fact that you gave me that money, you said, okay, here's a loan I'd like for you to pay back, but, but I received it as, you just want to help me, and maybe I'll pay it back, maybe I won't, and that's okay. And now a month goes by, and they didn't pay you back. A second month goes by, and they didn't pay you back. And now you start to make value judgments about them. But they, might, they are thinking of it completely differently. right? So cognitive, but then there's also effective. What do they think is good, beautiful, worthy, unworthy, things like that? For us, it was hard with Muslims. My wife and I, we love dogs. We've got two dogs as pets. Muslims, you cannot. Dogs are dirty. Dogs are unclean. If you were to pet a dog and shake their hand, that, that's a massive insult. That's, that's like cussing them out. You cannot do that. So, but they love cats, because Muhammad loved cats. So think of what's good, what's bad, what's clean, unclean, worthy, unworthy. They bring a worldview into how they think about those things. Uh, you may not understand that. You may not understand those things. Sometimes... For them, they're used to taking shoes off at the door. They don't wear shoes in the home. 
Now for us, it's like, oh, okay, you don't want to take dirt and dust into the house. That's one reason, but there's also in an animistic, folk, religious reason that when things are dirty, that's where bad spirits live. Good spirits live where clean things are. Bad spirits live where dirty things are, like toilets or, or dirt. So you take your shoes off at the door, not only to be, keep the floor clean, you don't want to bring any bad spirits through the dirt in your shoes into the home. But you don't realize they're making those assumptions because that's part of their worldview. All right, so there's the cognitive. For us, it was interesting with animals. Where we were, they loved horses. Horses, everything. They drank horse milk. They ate horse intestines. We ate horse meat all the time, which it really tastes like lean beef. Horse meat is actually not bad. Now, don't ever eat the intestines. Oh, those were... I couldn't get it down. I pretended to cough, and I found a way to put it... <laughs> Uh, I honestly, when I put that in my mouth, my only thing I felt was, this is wrong. A human shouldn't eat this. <laughs> and if you think what goes through an intestine, we, I don't think we should eat intestines. So, but anyway, they love horses. Everything about a horse was good, but a dog not good. Okay, That's that effective level. Uh, even, unfortunately, people. That was the hardest thing for us. Uh, uh, Anybody who had a handicap, they kept in the home because somehow they must have had a curse on them or they must have done something wrong or their parents did something wrong. There's, there's a bad spirit there. And so the saddest thing was handicapped people were, were kept away. Uh, they, they, it's shameful to show that you have handicapped people in your family. Okay, so that's difficult for us, right? We don't want to do that. We want to show that the image of God is in every human being. And so those are challenges. Uh, then the, uh, uh, the another one is the evaluative level. So you've got the cognitive, that you could think of the head. You've got the affective, the feelings, what's beautiful. But then there's the evaluative, uh, which is much more about standards of right and wrong. What's true, what's not true. Where we were is a shame and honor culture. You evaluate things not so much about right and what's, what's true and untrue, like, like uh, uh, yes or no, but more what will bring honor and what will bring shame. And that determines your behavior. So I remember my neighbor one day, he had a, a son who, uh, he was about 20, he was a bit rebellious. He'd go out at night. So I remember one night looking outside my window and I saw his son come home, get out the car, and he'd clearly been drinking. And he was all kind of wobbly and loud. And so the next day I saw my neighbor and I said, uh, hey, is your son okay? And he said, yeah, why? I said, oh, I thought I saw, I got up out the window late last night. I saw him come home and he looked like he maybe wasn't okay. I didn't want to say he looked drunk because I didn't want shame. I said, he said, oh, no, no, he is fine. No, no, that was a friend came over. That wasn't my son. It was another guy came. And, uh, yeah, he wasn't feeling so well. And, uh, but, no, it wasn't my son. No, 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 my son was at home all the time. But I know, I know his son. That was his son. <laughs> but for him, the right thing to do was preserve his son's honor. He must preserve the honor of his son. And so even if he tells me a lie that it wasn't his son, the right thing to do is not bring shame, but keep honor. That's a worldview, which clashes a lot with a Western worldview. It's say, no, be honest, man. You can be honest. It's not shameful. It's better to be open and honest. Nope, not in a shame and honor culture. So all of these play into this worldview. So now you are facing a challenge because you've got people coming from these kinds of cultures to this campus bringing these worldviews with these categories of assumptions, cognitive, affective, and evaluative. But they're being challenged because they suddenly are on a campus where there are rules and regulations and standards of behavior and ways to think that contradict. And for a lot of them, it's difficult to know how do you navigate? How do you, how do you deal with these things? And, and you have the opportunity to reach out and help them 
to, to understand, ask them, tell, I want to learn more about you. Tell me in your culture, how do things work? How does this work? How does that work? And help unpack. And that will really show them a, a, someone who really cares about me, who va actually values me. You're not forcing me to be like you, but you're actually wanting to know about me. That's very significant. A, a huge opportunity to reach into their lives, to, to say, I want to understand your worldview. I know all of us have to learn about not only American worldview, we have to learn about Texas worldview. Not only that, we have to learn about UTA worldview. And how things work at UTA. I want to help you. I, I want to learn about you and I want to help you understand the worldview here. So, okay. Um, so the West, our worldview and culture is very inde independent, individualistic. We're very bad independent. You make it. I've got four sons, right? You said to your son, go to college. Make the best of your life. You, you, know, you step out. Uh, don't, don't stay here. It's time for you to be on your own and to live your life and to make the most of your life. A very individual-focused culture. But many people from the non-West are very collective. Not independent, but interdependent. A classic example we have here in Texas is the whole Latino or Hispanic culture is very collective. So a lot of them, when they, if you earn a salary or you have something, you're always thinking, how can I help my family? How can I care for my family? What can I do for my family? So a lot of people who have good jobs here yeah, are thinking about how to send money back to their family. If their family lives somewhere else, Mexico or somewhere, and they're not well off, how can I help my family? You're always thinking interdependent. I'm, n I'm not by myself. Even if I leave home, even if I get married, I still belong to this big group. And so that affects a lot about how they think about life. That affects a lot about how you would speak to them and understand the family they come from. I, w I was told that one of the reasons we have, for example, a lot of students from India here at UTA is doing courses like engineering or an MBA is because they can go back and get really good job positions which then care for their family. So the family's investing in them because they will come back and, and, and invest in the family. So that's a big way to understand it. But we are living in an era of globalization. We are living in an era where it's no longer just you only somebody if you belong to the family. We're living in an area where people are saying, no, wait a bit. Uh, maybe, I, maybe I matter too as an individual. Globalization, one of its values is the value of the individual, which goes contrary to a group-oriented culture. So I think it's better to consider people on a, on a um, spectrum. Don't think, oh, if they come from a non-Western culture, they're all collectivist. They may not be, especially if they're from a city. They may be a little different now in about how they think about life. Let me give you an example. Marriage. In a lot of collectivist cultures, marriages are arranged. You, you don't choose who you marry. Primarily your mother chooses who you marry. And the argument, the rationale is, your mother knows you. She knows what you like. She knows what you don't like. She knows what makes you angry. She knows the kinds of things that would f work well for you. And so she knows without the distraction of romance and all that, she knows to go and look for somebody who would be a good match for you. Before online dating sites, collectivist cultures used mothers and grandmothers. <laughs> okay? But where I was in Kazakhstan, where a lot of this happens, uh, I spoke to a group of young college students and we were talking about this issue, and one girl stood up and she said, no one's going to tell me who to marry. I will marry for love. She said, my mother and grandmother will not tell me who to marry. I will marry for love. She is a more globalized, right? She's on the internet, she's mi mixing with other people, and she's saying, no. No, I have a right as an, as an individual to choose who I will marry. This is the effect of globalization, changing things. Actually, some students from Saudi Arabia, they also helped me understand it better. A guy said, yeah, actually, 
He said, it works okay for me. He said, my mom looks for somebody, but I don't have to marry her. Then, then my mom says, why don't we talk to their family? Why don't you and her go somewhere and just walk in the park and see? And if I don't like her, I come back and say, oh, mom, it's not happening. Uh, uh, we don't really like each other. Then my mom will say, okay, okay. And then my mom will look for somebody else. So it's kind of this joint venture together. And I thought, oh, maybe there's some wisdom in that. <laughs> so understand that it's a spectrum. It's, it don't just stereotype someone, oh, you're from a collectivist culture, you're completely this. Don't stereotype them. The world we live in is changing. They're probably somewhere on that spectrum. Okay? Um, so what influences your worldview? These, these circles are drawn equally, but really for each individual, the circles should be different in size because not all five of these things are equal. For some people, there's a much heavier emphasis on certain things. Yet, like I said, in the West, we should draw personal bigger. In a collectivist culture, family would be bigger. But for the sake of discussion, these are the five things that typically influence you. Personal. What do I mean by personal? Well, to give you an example, are you the oldest or the youngest in your family? Where we were, that was very significant. There was mu in a Muslim culture, there's much more pressure on the oldest person in terms of responsibility and the family's honor. And there was a lot of pressure on the youngest male. Because when the youngest male gets married, he and his wife have to live with the parents until they die. And they take care of the parents. There was no pension scheme or, or social security. They never cared about that. I don't have to care what happens to me when I get old. My youngest son and his wife, they will... They will cook our food. They will take care of everything we need. So that's a very personal thing about <coughs> am I the youngest son? Am I the oldest son? And in, in cultures too, am I male or am I female? It has a big effect in, in, in how I fit in my family and in my culture. So at a personal level, at a family level, uh, how, what is family? If you say, tell me about your family in America... You used to talk about your wife and your children. If you ask a collectivist culture person about your family, you better get a cup of coffee or tea and be ready because you're going to hear about grandparents and uncles and aunts and cousins and how far do you want to go. That's how big the family is. That's why often in a collectivist culture, one of the hardest things for them is a wedding. Who do you invite to the wedding? And how much does a wedding cost? People spend unbelievable amounts of money on a wedding because you can't leave anybody out in a big family. So it can be very challenging. Uh, Worldview is your culture. Uh, uh, lots of things to do with culture. It's the religious. How strong is the religious worldview? Uh, how, how much does it play into the way you live life? I'll give you a light-hearted example where we were. So again, in, in folk Islam, uh, toilets are dirty places. Bad spirits called jinn live in toilets. So if that's the case, you don't put a toilet in your house. Why would you bring the spirits into your house? You put it in the yard, and you don't put it right next to the house because then it's also too close. You put it in a far corner of the yard. So you've got to use, we call it in America, an outhouse. But where we were in the winter, you go to minus 20 in winter, was freezing. The snow would be deep. And I'd get up in the morning, and we had an indoor bathroom, but I'd watch my neighbor, and he'd be all big coat and everything, and there he's going through the snow early in the morning to get to that outhouse over there. And I just looked at him every morning. I thought, oh, my goodness. I thought, this is so cold. If I was you, by the time I got there, I'd be so cold I wouldn't be able to do anything. I mean, this is crazy. Why, what's wrong with an indoor toilet? But it, his, his religious worldview tells him, you can't do that. Better to freeze in the snow than have the gin in your house. Okay, so religious world plays into it. And then the non-religious world. Because we don't live 
any more in isolated circumstances where we only live with our people and everybody who sees. We live with other people around us who think other ways and have other uh, views of life that don't match our religion. So all of these play into a person's worldview. So you could actually think if you meet somebody here you want to share with, you could ask them questions on any of those types of topics. Hey, tell me where you come from. You come from Pakistan. Tell me about family. The, how, how does family work in your culture? Tell me about this part of your culture. That part, learn. Be a student. Learn their worldview. All right, so very, very important. We, had, we have to get to this slide. Spiritual worldview. So you've got to learn to ask very good questions about spiritual worldview. You just come and say, oh, hey, how are you, Sufnat? You're from Pakistan. Great to meet you. Uh, you like cricket? Me too. Hey, can I tell you about Jesus? Wait a bit. You've jumped in before understanding even what he thinks about God. What even is his concept? So are you going to take time to learn spiritual worldview? Who is God? Do they even have a concept of the spirit world? Is there such a thing? In Islam, there is a spirit, but they are confused about that. There's not clarity in the Quran about that spirit. So you want to learn from them. What, what does it mean? You'll find most cultures, non-Western, have a, have a very strong spirit world that has all kinds of spirits, including ancestor spirits in there. You want to learn about that. Uh, you want to ask whatever you, whatever, however you consider about who God might be, how does God view man? How does God think of man? So in Hinduism, where they have millions of gods, but they have the three big ones, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. Okay, And so how do those gods think of man? They think of man in terms of a cycle. So those, those three gods, Brahma creates you, uh, Vishnu sustains you, and then Shiva helps you end this life so that you, Brahma can create you again and you start the cycle again. And so in a Hindu worldview, that's how they see the God seeing man. We, we create man in this endless cycle until man's good enough to become one with the gods. So you want to learn that. You want to understand how they view that. What does worship look like? How do you worship God? Is it coming together? Is it individual? What is, is worship in the home? Is it at a place, dedicated place? Is there just personal devotion and worship that you do? How does that work? You want to ask these questions to learn about their spiritual worldview. A very important one is their concept of sin. Because almost every worldview does not see sin the way we do. Almost every worldview is different. The most common way other worldviews see sin is that it's something that can be made up by a good work. So definitely Islam is that, but Hinduism, Buddhism, most other worldviews, animism. If you've done something wrong, make up for it by doing something good. Think about it in Christianity. If I commit a sin, how many good works do I have to do to make up for it? How many? Can a million? Can a billion? Can a trillion? A gazillion? However high we... No. In, in Christianity, sin is so serious. It separates you from a holy God and condemns you. You're guilty because of sin. And you cannot make up for that sin. You see how serious sin is? But in most other religions, it's okay. Think about Islam where I told you if a man goes to the mosque on Friday right now and prays at the mosque, he gets plus 25 points. That makes up for 25 sins he committed. That's totally different to our concept of sin. You want to learn it because when you share the gospel, the gospel is, I am a sinner and Christ died and rose again for my sins to save me. We want to jump quickly to Christ dying and rising, rising again. But don't forget, when you say, I'm a sinner, what does their worldview think? 
Oh, you make mistakes, but then you do good things to make up. No, you've got to unpack what you mean when you say, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner and I know there is nothing I can do. Nothing I can do to make up for those sins. You've got to show the seriousness of the concept of sin. Are there spiritual intermediaries? Many contexts, it's ancestors who've gone before, who are now in the near spirit world, but there may be the concept of angels, saints, uh, people like that. So learn what are the spiritual intermediaries, but then you also need to be sure, do we have spiritual intermediaries? Well, the classic one is Jesus, but the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit for us is an intermediary, but do we believe in angels? Do we? Good, good angels? Bad angels? How does that all work? Are there angels here right now? We've got to learn that, right? Because you bet in their worldview they have all of that in that spirit world. And so we have to know how to respond to that and how to share with that. So one of the things you would learn if you come to our seminary, uh, which I'll be very happy to talk to you about, uh, we do a course in systematic theology. One of the classes is angelology. Who are angels? What does the Bible say about angels? How do angels work? What are the different categories of angels? We need to know that because they, they have that in their worldview. And we've got to be careful that we don't just pretend, say there's a world of just us and this faraway God. God's not far away because of the Holy Spirit. But there are other spirits too. So we have to have good answers for that. Are there holy places or people? In most religions, there are holy places or holy people. A guru or an imam or a certain place or a mosque or a temple or a tree. Some places, it's a certain trees are holy. In some places, cows are holy. When I was in Delhi, we were in a traffic jam because of a cow lying in the highway. But a cow, in Hinduism, a cow is a god. And so... I said, why don't they move the cow? They said, you can't tell God to move. God moves when God wants to move. Interesting, right? So you have to learn from them what are their holy places and people, but then the question becomes, do we have holy places and people? Is it more holy when you're in church on Sunday? Is it more holy in the middle of a church than a mosque or a temple? Are there special holy people? We've got to get that. That's very important. One of the things we believe the Bible teaches is the priesthood of all believers. So we know there's one Lord and King and Savior, Jesus, and under him everything's level. We don't elevate people. Now, Catholics do, but we as Protestant evangelicals, we don't do that. Everybody's Equal. That's very different to the worldview that most of them come from. Uh, we were taking a, this Muslim guy from Saudi Arabia to church. And he was a little nervous. And he said, like, I don't know how, like, what clothes am I supposed to wear? And how do I need to wash before? I, because in Islam, you've got to do all kinds of cleanliness and washing before you can go in. And he didn't know what to do. And he was so surprised when he said, well, just dress. You don't have to dress up. Just, just be modest. But yeah, come. And no, we don't have it. You can just walk right in. And that just like blew his mind. Because we said, the way we think about it is God's everywhere. So wherever God is, is holy. And he doesn't just live in, a, in, in the church. He's holy everywhere. So everywhere counts. So a lot about the worldview. Okay, uh, big question, how does this life relate to the next life? That's a good question. It's like, how, do, you, do you ever think about the afterlife? Do you ever think about when you die, is that just it? Or is there something more? Ask, that's a very good way to unpack their worldview. And then rituals. What are their religious rituals that they do? Sometimes we call them festivals. 
but are there certain religious rituals? All religions have rituals. Ask them about it, and then you reflect in if they say, what are your rituals? Do we have rituals? Yes. What? Communion. Communion, the Lord's Supper. Baptism. Those are two, okay, so I'm Southern Baptist. Those we consider two ordinances. Those are rituals. One, if they tell him, finish telling me about rituals, I'm going to tell them about those two rituals, which are the gospel. The Lord's Supper is the gospel, and baptism is the gospel. So what a great way. So you take time to listen to their rituals, then you get to share about yours. And you're able to immediately talk about the gospel. I know time's racing by, and I wanted to show you a tool um, of what to do, but I'm going to just, I'll share this with you because we need to know about a biblical worldview. What we're trying to do is transform their worldview into a biblical worldview. And so, a biblical worldview, I have to know, not my culture. I'm not trying to say, I'm trying to take Sufnat from Pakistan and turn him into a Texan. I don't want him to be a Texan Christian. I want him to be a biblical Christian. That follows the scriptures. Now, one of the ways to understand a biblical worldview, this is a whole other seminar on, on understanding a biblical worldview, uh, which you, I'll have to come again to teach you that if you want to know that. But fundamentally, it's part of the two commandments, right? Somebody came to Jesus and they were trying to catch him out and they said, which is the most important commandment? You remember he said, all the law and the prophets are summarized in two. So if you want to know what a biblical worldview is, it comes down to two things. It's not all of it, but these two are a crucial part. If someone says, so what's a true biblical worldview? I'm going to say, starts with loving God with all your being, your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, that before you even think of anybody else, you focus totally on God. And you love him with everything you have. A biblical view, worldview starts there. So if I'm going to ask in my culture, should I do this or shouldn't I do it? I've got a first question needs to be, can I love and honor and worship God and still do that? And if I can't, I need to say, you know what, I'm sorry, but in a biblical worldview, I can't do that. Because it will affect the way I love and honor and worship God. A biblical worldview is theocentric. It's not man-centered. It's God-centered. It starts there. Jesus said, the greatest commandment, love God. Then he said, and the second, it's very important, but remember it is second, is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. To love people. So a worldview is centered on love. Loving God number one, and loving people, number two. But if loving people will cause me to question whether I love God, I've got to come back to loving God first. That's number one. But think about that word love is the very center of a biblical worldview. And remember, that word love in the Greek is the word agape. And really there are three things that characterize agape love. It's unconditional. It's sacrificial. And it's focused on others. Those are the things that they define what we mean by agape love. Unconditional, sacrificial, and focused on others. Modeled in Christ. So a, a biblical worldview, the worldview we're trying to get them. I'm not trying to get them to be like an American. Well, you like football with your feet. I want to teach you to love American football. Well, maybe you'll like it, but that's not so important. I want to teach you to love God's worldview. Who Jesus is. Focus on him. Um, I think, yes, that's the end. So let's see if there's any questions. We, I know we have very little time left. I've given you a bit of a fire hydrant, but... Yes. Yeah, how do you share the concept of sin with a Muslim in a way that they understand it? So you unpack what they believe and you say, so what is sin... Does sin affect God, or is it only amongst people? Uh, how do you make up for your sin? And then what I do is I use as Matthew 1, 2, 3. So they see, even a kindergarten, I can remember that. First book in the New Testament, Matthew 1, 2, 3. Matthew chapter 1, verse 23 says, 
The Virgin Mary will be with child and bring forth a, uh, will bring forth a child, and his name will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. I start with that and I say, you know, most people think that God's God's up there, and if I just work hard enough and I do good, I can get to Him. So what I'm going to try and do is do a lot of good. And Muslims will leave an angel on your shoulders, keeping the score of good here and the score of sin here. So my goal. And I'll say this to them, and they're like, yes, that's true. I say, so your goal is to try and do as much good as you can and as little sin as you can, and that way you start going up to reach a high, holy God. Is that right? I said, oh, man, I know if I tried that, I'll never do it. I'll never do enough good, and I'll always have sin. I'm, I'll never make it to the standard God requires. But this name, Emmanuel, do you know what this name says? I don't try to get to God. Emmanuel is God with it. God came to me. God comes to me and he knows I cannot pay for my own sin. So God sends his son to pay for my sin. My sin's very serious. And I cannot be with God without my sin being taken care of has to be. Don't use words like atonement and all that. They don't know those words. Say, my sin must be paid for. But I know I can't pay for it. So I have to have someone who can. And so I use Matthew 1, 2, 3 with them. And Emmanuel. Yeah, so the, the head of the mosque in Irving told me that. He said he, he thinks there's some Christians who are actually going to end up didn't realize actually they were Muslims all along mm -hmm. because they were good people and their good works are good enough. Mm -hmm. um, it was interesting he said that. Mm -hmm. But the fundamental answer to them is this worldview, to say, look, everything the Bible teaches comes centers on this. Mm -hmm. Love. Love God and love others. If you don't do that... In, for me as a Christian, and from the beginning of my Bible all the way through my Bible, this is the very center of what it is. And so if I don't love God and I don't love you, then I'm denying the very thing that I believe in. And so that's what she, So you were right. They must see it, right? Remember the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works not hear your good words see your good works and your good works are, are done in love it's a massive it's a massive witness to muslims because them it's an obligation it's a duty it's not driven at so much by love as a duty i just if allah requires obedience and submission i just do this yes but their prayers are mostly recited. You get taught. So when, when you're old enough, you go to the mosque for lessons. You have to pray five times a day. They teach you each prayer for each of those five. Like we would recite the Lord's Prayer or Psalm 23. It's a ritualistic prayer. They said there is other prayer they can do, heartfelt. But the real tr prayer that counts is the ritualistic prayer. But ours are different. Ours is just different to that. Yeah. Any more? Yeah. 
Yeah, so that's a fundamental stumbling block with Muslims is the Trinity. Because number one belief in Islam is God is one. And the Quran says, especially if you read chapter 5 and 9 of the Quran, outright the lies. And even it says, in the, it says on Judgment Day, Allah will ask Jesus, did you say you are my son? And Jesus will say, Allah, you know all things. I would never say that. That's directly in the Quran. So for them, as soon as we say Jesus is God, we commit the greatest sin, which is to put a partner next to God. They just The concept of three in one is so hard. So being able to explain the Trinity is fundamental to witnessing to Muslims. You have to learn how to explain the Trinity. And it is a good way you can do it. You can't completely but you can give a reasonable explanation for the Trinity. That would take a bit too long to explain now. But they are, the Quran directly is against that. Jesus is only a prophet. And, they, and Jesus is also the only human being that's ever lived who never committed a sin. Even Muhammad sinned, but Jesus never sinned. So to them, how is it possible that the only person who lived a sinless life, God would allow to die on a cross? That's impossible. They said it was an imposter. The common argument that it was Judas. A lookalike, that Jesus actually looked like Jesus. And actually Judas was crucified, but, but Christians started to say it was Jesus. But their belief is God took him into heaven. When, when they wanted to crucify him, God took him straight to heaven, and Judas was in his place. And we are totally deceived to think that God would crucify the only sinless person that's ever lived, that's impossible. Yeah. So it's a hard one. You have to explain the Trinity. You just have to... I don't like arguing with them. I just like listening. And then just keep saying, well, well, let me tell you how I know it. Let me tell you my experience. And just share biblical truth. By the way, if, if they read the Bible, read, read all the Quran, they want you to. You know what you believe. The Quran won't change your faith. And if, but if, but if that will cause them to read the Bible, that's a great agreement. Yep. All right, one more. Okay, so I believe you should say, you, you should ask these first two questions. Can I go and love or love God? That's number one. Can I go and love them? The, there's a third question. Can I go, would it cause stumbling? If someone saw me go there, or if they see me participating, would it cause stumbling? The Bible's clear about that. And the fourth question is your conscience. The Holy Spirit in your conscience. So you have to find polite ways to just say, to say hey, I want to be your friend. But you know I'm a Christian, so I don't want to dishonor your faith and, and I'll ask if you would help me not dishonor my faith. I'd like to come, but can I just watch? Or can I just sit here? Or can I not drink that drink or participate? I don't think... I'm, I always tell believers, go, but go so that you can answer those four questions okay. And if they say, no, you have to... You have to sing the song to the idol, to Shiva. You have to sing a song to Shiva with us. And I'd say, I can't. And if they say, well, then we don't want you to come. You say, well, I'm sorry, but okay, then I can't come because I can't sing a song to Shiva. So you've got to, you've got to know, set boundaries, keep your identity as a follower of Jesus. But I think I always found there was ways to go to these things, but not participate in certain things. To say, I'm, I'm not going to do that, but, but I, but I want to show you that I'm your friend and I care about you. I'd like to come, but I just understand. And if I eat this food, you may say it's dedicated to the ancestors, but I understand if I eat the food, I know it's God providing for me. Uh, I understand what you think it is, but you understand that when I eat it, I'm eating as God's provision for me. You just have to navigate it that way. But keep a biblical worldview in perspective. 